Uh, hi guys. Uh, just want to welcome you guys to the student forum here with Dr. Carr. This is uh, what a Facebook turnout out of 100 people looks like. So uh, thanks for coming along. Uh, basically, we uh, sort of identified earlier this week that there've been, I guess it was that sort of six to eight week time period from the earthquake that there've been a large number of uh, issues that had sort of arisen in that time. And uh, we wanted to give students a chance to sort of voice those issues. And we wanted to make sure that they could say it directly to Dr. Carr and get a direct response so uh, we wanted to put this on as well, and we're also recording it as well, so hopefully we'll be able to put that online and make it available for uh, all the students who couldn't make it as well. So basically, I called for questions on Facebook and got quite a, a number on Facebook and also through emails, I sort of compiled them along the themes that came in. Um, so I'll be firing them at uh, Dr. Carr, and if you want to ask any questions after we've been through them, then uh, chuck your hand up and we can uh, Get, uh, get you on the mic as well. Um, Dr. Carr's just going to do a quick introduction himself before we kick straight into the questions. Right, thank you very much, Carl. Look, it's, it's actually good to have the opportunity to field questions, so I'm going to take very little time in the intro. Uh, the first thing, though, is to acknowledge, absolutely, that teaching in tents is not anybody's idea of a good way of delivering lectures, uh, and you'll be relieved to know that we are on track to stop teaching in tents uh, at the end of next week, in other words, at Easter break. When you come back after Easter, there may still be some tents, uh, there may be the occasional tutorial that needs to be there, but it is our intention that we will not be conducting lectures in tents after Easter. Uh, a number of questions that I'm not going to uh, preempt Cohen asking, but overall it is a vote of thanks to the student body for rolling with the punches during the last uh, seven weeks. Uh, the first three weeks of which the university was closed and many students made an enormous contribution to the community uh, through the work they did for the volunteer army. We've been back in classes of a form for the last four weeks. Some of those classes have involved a larger amount of self-directed and online learning than would ordinarily have been the case. And my hat is taken off to the students who have done all they can to make the most of the opportunity. And, of course, a vote of thanks to our staff who, in many cases, have had to restructure courses and offerings and programs and put materials online that they hadn't necessarily planned to have online less than a couple of months ago. Uh, we have made it through to this part of our first semester. There is some catch-up we need to do in the second part of this semester. And I still believe, as I have said before, that we will, during the course of this calendar year, deliver a full quality academic teaching program. So uh, it's going to take a bit more work on everybody's part, but credit to all those who have played their part to date, and thank you. So Cohen, questions? We'll kick straight into these questions. As I said, uh, a lot of them are from, uh, from students who sent them directly through. I guess starting from the starting point, and, and what a lot of people have sort of said is a lot of students have felt that um, they were left out of the loop about the university decision making and about what the real damage to any buildings was and that, that, that the process of the restart hasn't really been communicated and that perhaps the university focused more on the cash cows like international students, first year groups and this led to other students, specifically those further along in their degree, having reduced options. Right. So let's sort of unpack that into a series of questions. The first is, is obviously one about who knew what when and, and given people knew things, when were others told? So. Uh, literally in the first uh, two or three weeks, the management of the university didn't know a lot of things about the state of the facilities. And until we knew more about the state of those facilities, then we weren't in a position to make commitments about what options there would be for a large number of our students. So the facilities drove choices that we made and the priority was making sure that when we said a building was fit to reoccupy, it would be safe for that use. So what we did recognise is there were some other groups within the student body who were faced with different difficult choices. The first and obvious group were the roughly 130 students on study abroad exchange here who were only going to be here for one semester. They were a clearly identifiable group. They clearly had had one day of university with us and they were only going to be here for this semester. So we rapidly moved uh, to move them to Auckland, Victoria, 
and Otago so that they could get a New Zealand experience for the time that they had available. The next group were the international students and they were different because their home governments often wanted answers about choices, their agents wanted answers about fees, but mainly many of them didn't have the social, family and community infrastructure to support them after the earthquake and their own families were withdrawing them from university in many cases. Faced with that, we were in a position to make some decisions sooner. We had about 1,500 international students. About 300 of them have left the university and 1,200 remain enrolled. So from that point of view, it was nothing to do with cash cows. It was all to do with an identifiable cohort of students for whom there were some specific decisions that could be made and were able to be made quite quickly. The next thing that became apparent in terms of buildings was that in order to restart lectures, we were going to have to replace all the heavyweight ceiling tiles in all of the lecture theatres. And it wasn't that the lecture theatre buildings themselves were compromised, it was that we weren't prepared to let lectures be conducted in the prospect of 18 kilogram plaster tiles falling on students. Once we made that decision, then it became apparent that we needed to put in place alternative arrangements for teaching. The Oval Village was going to take between one and three months to commission, and therefore the decision was made to erect tents for teaching. So while you may have thought the focus was all on large taught courses, there were a series of decisions which flowed quite logically. It was also the case that in reviewing the campus and its facilities for opening, there was no point in declaring safe a single building if we were not confident that the buildings around it were also safe. And that gave rise to the idea of precincts and the idea that we would begin by opening up precincts that were safe and that required us to focus on clearing all the buildings or identifying the buildings in a precinct that weren't safe. And we obviously started with the Dovedale campus and what became known as the Clyde Road precinct. If I can just, sorry to yep. interrupt, I'll just stop you there. Just, would you say there was any emphasis put on the large amount of fees that international students do bring into the university in terms of response to them as to domestic students? No. Fees were not a driver. And why do I say that categorically? Our business interruption policy will cover us for lost fees for where there is direct connection between the students leaving and material damage to the campus. This was not about fees and money, this was about safety and logistics. Okay, if we just, I think you were heading towards talking about the tents on campus as well and teaching there. What was the sort of decision making process there and is there any sort of, was there any sort of research done into similar situations or how was it decided that the right. teaching in a tent for quite a long period of time was the, the next best option? Right, so I think the first thing is we became fixed with the knowledge that uh, the Oval Village was commissioned within a couple of weeks of the earthquake and therefore we knew that it wouldn't be available uh, until the beginning of the second term of the first semester and indeed we'll get the first 15 of those units handed over at the end of April, another 45 at the end of May and another 44 at the end of June. So there's a staggered rollout. It was then apparent that some of our teaching spaces weren't going to be available for at least a month or six weeks and faced with that option the idea was presented to the senior management team that if we erected a series of marquees, we would be able to create some face-to-face -face teaching experience for students um, very much more quickly than we were otherwise going to be able to provide. And then we would be able to put ourselves on a trajectory to gradually reintroduce the lecture theatres as their ceilings were replaced and then migrate to the Oval Village when it became available. So it was a way of creating a continuity in the face of a significant discontinuity. I guess if we move away from the facilities side of things a little bit, how can the students who are learning at Canterbury now and have been here this semester, the ones who stayed, how can they be sure that what they've been taught over this earthquake period is up to the pre-earthquake degree standard? How can we know that we're gonna come out with a degree even with reduced contact with lecturers, reduced access to space, how can we be sure that we're still getting a high quality degree? 
Well, I think the first thing to keep in mind is that anybody who thought the last um, six weeks was equal to the first six weeks of last year clearly is, is not thinking carefully. There's no way I could represent that this last six weeks looks like the first six weeks of 2010. The question that we've put to our academic staff is, let's make sure we focus on the learning outcomes that are required over the course of the program. And it is the case that some courses have been restructured to bring to the front end of the course or program uh, the work that doesn't involve, for example, laboratories. Uh, in some of our courses that involve field work, we move the field work forward in the course program. So over the course of the program, the exposure to the different types of learning will be what it was, but it is absolutely observable that what's happened in the first six weeks is not comparable. What I believe, and the academic community believe, is that we will be able to deliver the same quality of educational outcomes over the course of a program of study and learning and in terms of a degree qualification. So in terms of making sure that we uh, maintain the academic integrity for the students who have missed out, what process is envisaged to help those students with reduced access to labs to catch up later in the year and re reduced access? I mean, the example that I've had is a student who later this semester will be using a first year biology student having to use the microscopes and that, and they're learning about it now, but they've never actually had access to a microscope? Yeah, look, there'll be some of those kind of circumstances. Um, the question will become later in the term when they get access to a microscope, uh, what is the appropriate way of ensuring the learning outcome? Is it double up the time? Is it spread the time over more of the year? Uh, in terms of the actual lost time as a result of changes to the examination period, the study break and the midterm break, um, of the three weeks that we were closed, uh, we've caught up two of those weeks. The question is how we distribute the learning experiences over the balance of the year. And I have great confidence in our academic community who are the professionals to make sure that that rebalancing occurs. Will there be any reflection in the marking for students who have had their uh, resources affected? What we've said to our academic community is focus on the learning outcomes this is the juggling act between the need to maintain quality, the need to ensure that the students have actually acquired the knowledge that was required during the program. We've said to our academic community that this isn't a way of giving soft passes or soft credits, that's not in anybody's interest, but it is sensible to reflect on what the learning outcomes were that were set and expected in the time that was available, knowing that in the course of the rest of the term, the semester or the year, or in fact a three or four year degree, that the balance of learning outcomes can be achieved. Why is it that the, um, we, we, we're talking about the, much of the facilities coming back on by Easter, why is it that uh, disruptions will be continuing right through the rest of the semester? Well, what we knew after the September quake is that there was a lot of remediation work that would be required throughout buildings. They were safe buildings, but they weren't necessarily buildings that were up to a standard that you could reasonably expect over time. The uh, teams had estimated that if we only used uh, semester breaks and the summer recess uh, to remediate buildings, it would take 37 years to do all the work that needed to be done. Knowing that, we've decided in constructing the oval uh, village to create decanting space so we can move uh, faculty out of whole floors and whole buildings so that the trades can get at those buildings and move very quickly to remediate them. But that said, some of this just takes time. So as I stand here today, there are over 150 uh, employees of Hawkins Construction and their subcontractors working on our site. Uh, we've had over 40 different engineers through the university in the last seven weeks, uh, and we've still got eight of those on site at the moment. So we have certainly commandeered resources to progress uh, this as fast as we can. There are 8,000 rooms at the university, 240 separate structural spaces, uh, and about 190 of those spaces have been returned to us and more every day. So the disruption is going to continue because our priority is to make sure when we give a building a warrant of fitness that we believe it is fit for purpose. I guess coming back to the base question here is in the next, next term, so the second half of the semester, can students expect an increase in contact hours, not just up to the normal, but above and beyond that to catch up for what they have missed? Um, each 
program or course of study will develop its own way of ensuring the learning outcomes can be achieved. That doesn't necessarily mean it's contact hour for contact hour. Um, it is fair to say that the relationship between the number of lectures you attend and the grade you achieve is statistically less than significant, would be the way to say it. Uh, what we need our academics to do is work with the students and their courses and programs to establish for which students more contact is the most effective way of getting the learning outcomes. And it might not be the case that catching up lost hours uh, is always the best use of that time. I'm prepared to trust our academic community to make those judgments. In terms of a specific group of students, postgraduates have raised a few issues in feeling that they've been somewhat left out in the recovery. Specifically, a lot of them have yet even to be able to complete enrolment, from what we've heard, and this is affecting them not just academically, but also financially. Yeah, I, I, Cohen did give me a heads up that this was the case. Uh, I've certainly heard of two, there may be more, um, postgraduate students who for various reasons fell between the cracks in terms of their enrolment processes. Um, if any postgraduate students are caught in cracks, either between study link or the enrolment process, please send me an email. I would like to know of your case because then we can deal with it. There are specific circumstances where some students had ceased study and then tried to re-enroll or where study link had failed to understand their circumstances. I'm very happy to intervene in specific cases. The postgraduate students fall into two categories, taught postgrads who are doing masters and research postgrads, some of whom who are doing masters, some of whom are doing PhDs. And there's no doubt that the research intensive postgrads have faced difficulties in accessing libraries and laboratories. In the libraries case that has gone on since September last year, and although we've made available enormous online learning resources into loans and the travel grants to visit other libraries at other universities, I am prepared to admit that this has not been what we would all want. And the consequence of that has been that some of our students have been granted extensions for their work, and I believe StudyLink has recognised the need for those extensions. In the second quake, access to laboratories has also been delayed somewhat further, but mainly those laboratories are now back up and running. So the question will be how far set back have some of those research programs been? And to some extent, we don't know that until we understand the state of some of the restart equipment and some of the lost uh, research materials. So we're working through that literally case by case. Okay, another question that has come to us a lot from students is why is it that they're having to come to lectures at times like seven o'clock on a Friday, eight o'clock on Saturday morning, and yet if you walk around campus, you can often see spaces, whether it's a tent or a lecture theatre, that are unused mm -hmm. and empty. Mm -hmm. Th this is a fair question. It's one that's exercised the senior management team for exactly the same reason. And it comes about for a couple of reasons. One is that we are trying to reconverge as large as we can on the course timetable and space utilisation that existed when we started the year. Why? Because of the clashes that inevitably occur if you try and free format a new timetable every week. So there has been a destination here which is to try and put back into spaces where they started lectures which had been planned to occur at times in the week when they were originally scheduled to avoid as much as possible timetable clashes. The consequence of that is that there have been occasions when there may have been an empty slot on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, but the program is a Monday, Wednesday, or a Tuesday, Thursday roll. So please accept that the timetabling people are using their best endeavours with over 2,000 different courses to schedule this week. When can we expect to have that concrete consistency in the timetabling which, we, which students who came to Canterbury were expecting? And it's not an unreasonable expectation. It usually takes four months to set the university's timetable, and it's usually set uh, in about May or June for the following year. And we've been rewriting the timetable every week for the last month. The intention is to try and get a much more settled timetable for the second term, and requests have gone out to faculty to try and nail down that. Uh, it's not a promise, but we certainly understand the desire. Certainly by the second semester, 
we would expect to know what spaces we've got and to be able to timetable them for a steady state. Well, just my last question here that I've been sent in is, um, can you just tell us what your, what your direction is and your sort of focus for the University of Canterbury in terms of the academic integrity and the university experience for current students and then moving into the medium or long term? Look, it is extremely important that those who come to the University of Canterbury and graduate in the next two or three years are seen to have had and to have attained the standard of excellence in their education and outcomes that any other cohort of students would have had. It is not in their interests or our interests to have degrees which are in any way tainted by association with the earthquake. So we will be maintaining our standards, for sure. That's in everybody's interest. The current generation of students, those who already carry a University of Canterbury degree from past experience and those who will enrol in the future. That secondly, we do have a vision of a university that contributes to its community, not only through its graduates, but by the actions and participation of its current student community. And this student body has proved that so well. And thirdly, we do have a vision of a university that is internationally connected and locally relevant. And that is part of our strategy that we developed in the last two or three years. We will take the opportunity from what we've learned about overseas exchanges and what the students have taught us about service learning to embed those experiences as part of our curriculum. But we will not compromise on the core quality of the learning outcomes that are essential when you graduate from this university. It's about programs, faculty, motivated and talented students, and about facilities, and we'll get those facilities back to you in fit-for-purpose state just as soon as we can. Well, well uh, anyone, if anyone's got any questions that they want to ask, then uh, if you yell them out, I will relay them through the mic and get Dr. Carter to uh, answer them. And there's two free tickets to tomorrow's sold-out gig for the person who asks the best <laughs> question. I'm bribing you. The question was, are there any peer reviews being done on the uh, structural engineer reports that are uh, currently engaged by the university? Yeah, so the, the first thing is that we are using multiple sources of engineering advice. We're, we're not, um, for example, using our own civil engineers to provide that advice. Not because we don't trust them, we do, but we think it's important that we use the outside uh, consulting firms. So Holmes Consulting and Becca Carter have done most of the work for us. As I mentioned before, up to 40 different uh, engineers have been through the site looking at different things over the last seven weeks. Wherever we come to a difficult choice that is not obvious, then that case is peer reviewed. So in the case of the UCSA building, uh, the initial reviews were conducted by Holmes Consulting, peer reviewed by Pe Becca Carter. Uh, the same process is being applied wherever we have a building which is observed or deemed to be challenged by either observation in its first past assessment uh, by discovery on its second past assessment or by modelling where all of our structural spaces are being modelled to understand how they might be expected to perform in a subsequent major event. Any other questions? Yeah, so I'll take the guy on the grey top and then you go. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering um, if you give us a brief rundown on the, some of the major buildings that have been damaged and the, uh, the damage that's occurred to them. Just yep. wondering what yeah. That was just asking a question about what uh, buildings have suffered the major damage. I heard um, also that the, the above building uh, was not, uh, people weren't in it because uh, it had a similar construction to the CTB building and they were scared to go back in. Right, so let's first squash that completely. No, the Rutherford building is not of a similar structure to the CTV building. The issue with the Rutherford building is it has a central core stairwell and the columns supporting that stairwell need to be strengthened before we can meet the requirements for large numbers of people to exit the building uh, under distressed circumstances. So the building is being accessed by smaller numbers of uh, faculty uh, because the building structure is sound, it's just that question about the strengthening of that uh, central stairway. So no, there is no uh, evidence that there is uh, comparability between that structure and the CTV building. So let, let me tell you the one building that, that we have identified that we want to know a lot more about. 
and that's the chemical and process engineering home, which is called the Simeon Building, which sits between the engineering and sciences library on the one side and the special purpose labs on the other. Modelling has indicated that we should strengthen that building, uh, that we are seeking advice on how long and how much that might take, and the alternative is to bulldoze it. That's why the engineering and physical sciences library is not open at the moment. Uh, we've allowed limited numbers of people to enter the special purposes laboratory, no more than eight people at any one time, and it has safe exits for that number of people. There is nothing structurally wrong with either the engineering and physical sciences library or those special purpose labs. They just happen to stand next to a building that suffered no major structural damage in either quake, and we couldn't find any when we investigated, but when we modelled it, we had more questions. So that's a specific one. A um, couple of other specifics. The Commerce Building is actually two buildings which share a common atrium and stairwell complex. Uh, the movement of those two buildings has compromised the atrium and the stairwell, so we need to strengthen the atrium and find a new technology for the uh, walling inside the stairwells to make those safe for large numbers of people to leave under distressed circumstances. Uh, in the meantime, that's a building that needs quite a lot of remediation work through the injection of resin into the cracks in the concrete slabs, although there's no structural damage to the, uh, the reinforcing in those slabs. So the decision's been made to basically clear the building and refurbish it before it's reused. So a large number of commerce faculty uh, will be housed in the law building and on the uh, oval where more teaching spaces will be provided. The law building itself is having the remedial treatment that I've described undertaken at the moment, which is the injection of resin to give the compression strength back to the concrete, where the concrete itself um, has protected the reinforcing rods from any stress or structural damage. So that's the kind of work that's uh, going to take six weeks or so in the law building, which is why we're not back there at the moment. Um, the, the cycle goes on. Let me give you a good news one. Well, good news, bad news. The recreation centre. Uh, the end of it closest to the river, which contains offices and the sports science lab, has decided to wander off and investigate the Avon River. Uh, that's not good, so we've had to close that part of it off. And the sports hall needs some strengthening to the structural supports for the roof. Uh, but the middle part of it, the gyms, the spin cycle rooms, the um, uh, toilets and showers and squash courts will all be open from next Monday. So we are progressively bringing back the safe fit for purpose, warrant of fitness past bits uh, of the campus as quick as we can. The UCSA building, uh, we've taken these two sets of separate structural advice, both of which conclude further strengthening work would be required on that building uh, before it could be reused for mass occupation. Uh, and we've got quantity surveyors and engineers making estimates of the nature of that work and its cost uh, as we speak. Uh, so there's as I say, a, a large number of spaces, there's 17 different buildings currently being worked on by tradesmen to remediate as I speak. So rather than going through the whole list, I'm happy to take specific questions about specific buildings. Um, look, I think the first thing is that, that most of the literature would suggest that the blended or flexible learning option is way preferable to pure online learning, and we'd accept that. That even if you're making materials available online, uh, it's important to provide face-to-face -face opportunities in tutorial settings or, or lectures which may be less frequent. So I'm not making a pitch here for going you know, universally online for courses. It was a, a, a series of things that were an option we chose to exercise in some cases for a short period of time to get things uh, moving. In terms of the experience that students have had, look, it has been varied. Um, there's no doubt that if you're off campus and you're struggling with data caps, uh, that the speed and cost of download uh, hasn't always been um, really that pleasant. It's been expensive or slow, acknowledge that. Uh, on campus, uh, much less of an issue, uh, but off campus, certainly an issue. 
Um, some of our academics have put materials online literally just to make them available for download, so it's worked more like a message board. Of course, online learning in its fully developed state involves a lot more interaction, even if it is remote or distant, than simply posting things onto a website. So we completely understand that the experience described as online learning uh, can be very different from go get the PowerPoint or look at the downloaded video of the lecture, which uh, is, a, is a pale reflection of true online learning uh, development. We have some online learning and flexible learning skills and experiences in the College of Education and in other parts of the university that we're using to better inform how we should do this. Uh, but certainly this university is a campus-based university. We see one of our core strategic advantages as being a university where you come to learn. So there is not going to be any great wholesale desire uh, to teach only and exclusively uh, via the online mechanisms. You have any more questions? Yep, sorry. You, you mentioned um, before about um, trying to keep the classes um, on their normal days and preferably on their normal times. A uh, course that I'm currently doing, uh, the timetable changed um, for, uh, from its normal um, part, um, part of the lecture theatre, the normal time, to a different lecture theatre which was smaller in size uh, for the class requirement and also to a later time which was 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock at night. Um, when will those sort of um, bit, um, changes revert back to normal? Yeah. Look, I can't make a promise about the reversion. What I have said is that the desire is to reconverge. I mean the reality is we're not going to get back all of our teaching spaces this year. Uh, currently there are seven lecture theatres in the science lecture theatre block. Uh, it's not clear when they will become available. There's one lecture theatre uh, in the mushroom uh, in engineering that's not looked like it's coming back for six or eight weeks at least. And as I've already said, we've got a lot of teaching space in commerce which is not coming back. So while it is our desire to reconverge, I cannot make you a promise that that can happen. There are compromises, there are trade-offs, and I know that some people are caught in very difficult circumstances as a consequence. Yeah, you had a question Yeah, um, you said before that uh, students come to the university to learn, but a key part of uh, your university experience is the social experience. Yes. So um, what's the time frame that we've got before the repair work to be done on the museum building right. and the um, social spaces that are involved with that? Look, so the question is about, um, look, coming to university is more than about just learning it includes social experience. Absolutely agree with that. Uh, social experience spaces on campus have been compromised, the UCSA building in particular. And of course the off-campus uh, social experience space has been even more severely compromised. There's not much I can do about that. The reality is that we have been in conversation with UCSA. We know that the assessment and decision making around remediation of the UCSA building is going to take months. It's not going to be done in weeks. There are some options which we're canvassing with UCSA and Cohen can probably reveal what he needs to about those. Uh, he's working with his executive to see what best options there are for space on campus and near campus. Uh, we certainly want to work with UCSA to help make sure there are appropriate spaces. Um, the Students Association is pretty innovative. Uh, you'll notice the big tent, super tent, super top. Uh, that's their idea and we're happy to support it, both financially and by the uh, graduation recognition events that we uh, are holding there this uh, coming week. Uh, so, but we do know that this is a part of what is missing and we will do what we can to facilitate re-access to some of those spaces on campus and where appropriate near campus. But Cohen, you yeah. might want to pitch up. Probably fill in a bit more in terms of like the social space side of things. Initially, even from right after the earthquake, we didn't see it as an excuse to not be doing that side of things, but uh, we still had to recognise the other factors that were playing on it. Like one was obviously lack of access to facilities and two was um, often large scale social events which students are pretty well known for can put a lot of pressure on a city's infrastructure so we started off by running the biggest events we could with the best acts and in a sort of alcohol free way and we had all the events that played here uh, from there we sort of looked on during that time we were looking for other locations that we could use um, around the city that were safe and accessible for students and also uh, wouldn't put the pressure on that infrastructure we've been in, discussions with like uh, local pubs and you'll see some of the clubs have uh, uh, taken up those offers 
uh, for social space and providing the services that the clubs do, which are totally a really essential part of UCSA. Um, obviously, we looked to try and do some other ways to make up for like the loss of O-Week and the loss of that interaction space and the super top tomorrow, uh, the event there is another example of that as well as grad ball in the next week. So we're the, we're the only people in Christchurch who are even close to running gigs. And, um, but we're still, we're really trying to work on that. We've been talking to the Record and Working Men's Club as well, trying to lock that in. And we've thrown, um, we threw the Czechs gig there as well. So we recognise that it's hugely important. And um, although we're putting a huge amount of energy in trying to figure out the situation with our building, at this stage we're waiting on designs on what would be needed to bring it up to a level where we'd be comfortable putting those large numbers of students in there again because that's the call that comes down to me and the exec in the end is, is whether we want to send in you know, 3,000 3, people for a perfect storm. Um, or, and we, if we do that we really want to make sure that um, we're doing everything that we can to make sure that it's as safe as possible for students because I mean it all boils down to that in the end. So um, yeah, we're sort of looking for sort of balancing those two aspects, recognising that it's really important to have parties and social space and interaction and help the clubs out in what they do, but on the other hand, the big question is always safety for us. Yep? Uh, at this stage, uh, it's pretty expensive, so um, we're, it's going to be up all next week and use all next week, but it's going to be, um, they won't until after Easter to take it down, but basically We've been trying to sneak in another few events there, but the, people, the owners of the marquee charge you per event. And so, um, although they have been really supportive and given us a pretty cheap deal, or else we wouldn't be able to do it. But yeah, yeah. Yep. What's the timeline of the Central Library reopening? Okay, Central Library reopening. Um, we think that we're going to have Level 2 and Level 3, which are the kind of um, more social learning spaces, open on the 2nd of May. After that, progressively each week we'll be able to open a number of floors as we move up the building, hoping to have the, the whole thing open for access um, possibly by the end of May. Now we need to be a bit careful because the minute we commit to timelines, people bank them and then they get enormously frustrated if it takes longer. The issues inside uh, James Hyatt are not um, structural in terms of the building structure. The building performed as spec and beyond. Uh, the the uh, seismic joints all moved and popped, uh, that we knew they should do, but they need to be reset. Uh, the shelves that we had bought, and, uh, they all stood up, so that was great. Uh, the books decided to take a wander again, so they're still on the floor. Um, and we need to do the concrete injection trick in the stairwells to make sure the concrete has its compression strength uh, that we expect it to have. So that's what's causing a bit of the delay in there. Uh, but the intention is obviously to get it uh, reopened as soon as we believe it is safe not only to get into, but also to get out of. We got any more questions out there? Uh, are, you, are you coming back in a set period of time or will you be back in front of us at the same time? Yeah, if you, if you want. We'll, we'll make it happen. Have to bring some of your mates. <laughs> Can you bring the registrar too, please? Huh? <laughs> Yeah, well, we're definitely we're really keen to uh, organise another one because it's really important and I think it's been pretty useful today to get the, uh, the questions out uh, in front of Dr Carr as well. So, um, yeah, no, we'll definitely be looking to organise another one, perhaps in a month's time, uh, later on um, after Easter, and once we can see how progress is being made on what we've talked about here today. So if there are no other questions out there, we should probably call it a day on that note. Uh, Thank uh, everyone for coming along. Thanks to Dr. Carr for answering questions. If you've got any questions at any stage, make sure you flick them through to me. I'm always happy to find out uh, find out what it is you want to know and, and put your point across because that's my job. Sweet. Thanks. Very good. Thanks, Carr. Thanks, Carr. Thanks, Carr. Thanks, Carr. Thanks, Carr. Thanks, Carr.